Pudor. Gay. Poor. Ayr. Long ago, Greek philosophers believed that all matter was made from one single primordial substance. Then, everything changed when Empedocles proposed four elements that made up matter water, earth, fire, and air. A hundred years passed, and Aristotle theorized a new element, an air like substance called ether. And although these philosophers lived more than 2,000 years ago, their ideas about the elements changed the world. Hey friends, welcome back. We're here with our second episode in our Elements series, answering Alan's question about how the four elements play into ritual magic in ancient Greece and ancient Rome. Like I said last time, we are doing a whole sort of history of the four elements in Greek and Roman thought. So last week we talked a little bit about archaic mythology, a little bit about pre-Socratic philosophy, and we got into medicine. Today we're focusing entirely on the city of Athens at its height, 5th century, 4th century. It's a very tumultuous time for the city of Athens. It's embroiled in wars first with Persia and then the Peloponnesian War. Yet this is the time when Athens really produces its best art and its most influential scholarship. And in particular, Athens is the city that produces maybe the most famous and influential Greek philosopher, that is Plato. So that's what we're going to be covering today. Like I said last time, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of sources. Everything that I talk about will be listed in the description down below. I just have kind of like a running tab for this series, so a lot of it is going to be the same as last time, but I am adding to it each time. Hey friends, welcome and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Kate. This is Hearth of Hymonia, and we're here to discover and unpack the beliefs held by ancient Greek and Roman people, and sometimes their neighbors. We dig into everything, from mythology to magical practice, philosophy, and all those related subjects. If this kind of thing appeals to you, feel free to subscribe. And if you have any thoughts about today's topic, I invite you to share them in the comments. My comment section is very friendly, and many thanks for that. I want to start today with the story of a titan, an ally to humanity who was punished for his beneficence towards mankind. I'm talking, of course, about Prometheus, who brought humans the gift of fire. The story originates in the Archaic period, at least that's the earliest version of it that we have, in Hesiod's Theogony. Hesiod tells the story like this. Prometheus tricks Zeus by butchering an ox and giving Zeus the flesh and the fat, but giving others the bones. Zeus is very angry about this, and as punishment, he wouldn't give fire to humans. But Prometheus stole it, and he kept it inside a fennel stalk and brought it to humans anyway, for which he was punished, by being chained to a rock, where an eagle, the symbol of Zeus, would come and eat his liver every day. Because he's a titan, it doesn't kill him, but he is punished in perpetuity until he is rescued by none other than Heracles. This story is picked up and fleshed out, no pun intended, in an Athenian tragedy called Prometheus Bound. It's attributed to Aeschylus, uh, the first of the three great Athenian tragedians, although the authorship is disputed. Um, if he did write it, it would be his last published work. And having read a little bit of it for this video, I am a little skeptical that it's written by Aeschylus just because Aeschylus is so difficult and impenetrable and this was comparatively very easy to read. 
But the play is called Prometheus Bound. It would have been performed like other plays at a festival, maybe the city Dionysiac. I wasn't able to find anything about whether or not this play won any awards. Um, usually that information is preserved. I wasn't able to find it, so if anybody knows about that, let me know in the comments. The play takes place after Prometheus has given fire to humans and he has been found out and is being punished. So we open with actually Hephaestus, another fire-related deity, who has been instructed by Zeus to chain Prometheus to this rock. Hephaestus is the best man for the job because he is in charge of metalworking, and so he's able to provide adamantine chains that Prometheus can't break out of. But Hephaestus really doesn't want to punish Prometheus. He's very upset about having to do this, and he has to be convinced by his companions, um, personified power and force or something like that, to obey the will of Zeus and keep himself out of trouble. So this is what personified power, or Kratos, says to Hephaestus. He says, Hephaestus, there's need for you to take care of the orders which your father sent to you, to restrain this evildoer on the rock cliffs in unbreakable bonds with adamantine restraints. For your flower, fire's flame, assistant in all arts, he stole and gave to mortals. For such offenses of his, he must pay a penalty to the gods. These opening lines show the importance that fire has in human society, which is something I think we all know, but it's said explicitly here, fire is involved in all human endeavors, all technologies or arts. So you get a sense that the play is going to have this elemental theme. And by the time Prometheus speaks, which is almost 90 lines into the whole play, his first words are are an invocation to these various uh, supernatural powers that, to me at least, when reading them, scream the four elements. So I'm going to read you these lines, and you tell me if you think this is a reference to the four elements or not. Prometheus says, O heavenly ether and swift-winged winds, river springs, boundless laughter of ocean's waves, earth, mother of all, and all-seeing orb of the sun, I call on you, witness how I suffer, a god at the god's hands. Sounds a lot like air, water, earth, and fire to me, but you let me know about that. The rest of the play is essentially various beings, various uh, personifications and anthropomorphic deities coming to visit Prometheus, and characters from mythology like Io pops up, she's really important, like to the overall plot of the play, but not so much for our purposes. And everyone's asking Prometheus what happened and how and why, and he's telling the story uh, that pretty much lines up with what Hesiod says about how, quote, I hunted the source of fire and hid it stolen in a fennel stalk. Fire, the proven teacher of every art and means to a great end for mortals. For such an offense I pay the price pinned down by these chains in the open air. And Prometheus blames Zeus entirely for denying mortals fire, denying mortals the advantages that fire brings. This is what he says a little bit later. As soon as he, meaning Zeus, sat himself on his father's throne, straight away he arranged various gifts for the other gods and organized their spheres of influence. But of wretched mortals, he didn't give a thought. Instead, he wanted to annihilate their whole race and create a new one in its place. And no one went against these plans except for me. I had courage. I set mortals free so that they didn't end up going to Hades totally destroyed. For this, then, I am bent by such misery to endure suffering pitiful to see. I placed mortals above all in pity. I myself am not considered worthy to receive it but ruthlessly thus I am punished, shameful to Zeus's glory. Prometheus seems to think that Zeus hates mortals and was ready to wipe them out and replace them with something else, but Prometheus, for whatever reason, and he does give us um, a little bit of insight into the condition of humans prior to having fire, he feels bad for the human race and he wants to help them out. 
and he's complaining about being punished, he finds the whole thing very unfair. And it's clear that, at least in the context of this play, fire really is what makes humankind what it is. It's not an abstract spark of life, necessarily, but it does create the conditions for mankind to flourish. Uh, I want to read you one more passage, and it's the passage where Prometheus is describing what life was like for people before he brought them fire. Uh, it's really pitiful. So uh, this is the last passage I'll read from this, and for this one I'm reading Smythe's translation on Perseus. Prometheus says, First of all, though they had eyes to see, they saw to no avail. They had ears, but they did not understand. But just as shapes in dreams, throughout their length of days without purpose, they wrought all things in confusion. They had neither knowledge of houses built of bricks, and turned to face the sun, nor yet of work in wood, but dwelt beneath the ground like swarming ants in sunless caves. They had no sign either of winter or of flowery spring or of fruitful summer on which they could depend, but managed everything without judgment, until I taught them to discern the rising of the stars and their settings, which are difficult to distinguish. Yes, and numbers, too, chiefest of sciences, I invented for them, and the combining of letters, creative mother of the muses' arts, with which to hold all things in memory. I, too, first brought brute beasts beneath the yoke to be subject to the collar and the pack saddle, so that they might bear in men's stead their heaviest burdens. And to the chariot I harnessed horses and made them obedient to the rain, to be an image of wealth and luxury. It was I, and no one else, who invented the mariner's flaxen-winged car that roams the sea. Wretched that I am, such are the arts I devised for mankind, yet have myself no cunning means to rid me of my present suffering. I think the way that we should read this passage is not that Prometheus, like, spent all this time with humanity teaching them each individual art. Rather, I think that by giving humankind fire, he is describing what happens after people get fire, all of the things that we're able to accomplish because we have this fundamental basic technology. So there's a lot going on in this play that I'm not going to cover just because it has to do with other topics. Uh, it's a really rich and interesting play, totally worth um, a read or a listen. I did link a really, really awesome audiobook that's on YouTube of this play, so you should definitely check that out. This play would most likely have been one of a trilogy. A lot of tragedies were part of a trilogy, and we have uh, some fragments and some hints about what the other two plays would have been. So this might have been the first one, and then the second one would have been Prometheus Unbound, where Heracles comes to rescue Prometheus after whatever it is, like 10,000 years or something. And then the final play, Prometheus the Firebringer, uh, supposedly talks about Prometheus's reconciliation with Zeus. He gives Zeus some good advice, and he gets Zeus out of, like, a tricky situation, so all is forgiven and they reconcile. But now to get into the heart of the matter here. Just to recap, last time we talked about Ionian philosophy and the quest for the Arche, that single unified principle from which the entire universe emanates. Some philosophers think that it's water, some think air, some earth, some fire, uh, especially Heraclitus. And this is the going theory until Empedocles, the Sicilian philosopher, says, no, actually, there's four elements that sort of combine together to create everything that we see in front of us today. And once Empedocles puts forth the four elements theory, that basically becomes the theory henceforth. We also have the influence of Zoroastrianism, uh, which is a religion that was practiced in Persia and is in fact still practiced today, where fire is revered and cultivated and uh, worshipped, if I can use that word, as one of two sort of primary 
purifying substances, the other being water, although in Zoroastrianism, fire is more important. And I said last time that Persian influence on Greek life was about to heat up, and that's because we are now entering the period of the Persian Wars. So just a quick Spark Notes version of the Persian Wars, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with this point in history. The Persian Wars are, above all else, a conflict between Persia and the variously aligned Greek city-states over the status of Ionia. That's a simplification, but that's really what gets things started. And our main primary source for the Persian Wars is, in fact, an Ionian Greek called Herodotus. So all the way back in the 6th century, Cyrus the Great conquers the city-states of Ionia and brings them into the Persian system in 547 BCE. Once Ionia is under Persian control, Cyrus sets up a system of almost kind of like Roman client kings where you have like a local person who is part of the conquered population, so presumably Ionian Greek who is promoted by the Persian government to rule over individual city-states, uh, but ultimately to report back to the Persian king himself. And this system lasts until the turn of the 5th century, when the Ionian Greeks revolt against the Persians. And this drags other Greek city-states into the conflict. Even though Greece is not politically united, they're closely allied. So... Other cities get involved, including Athens. And the war drags on. Now, a quick side note here. When the Persians win a battle or uh, make some kind of military advancement and they are seeking surrender from their opponent, they ask for a symbolic gift of earth and water. Now, I don't think that this has anything to do with the four elements. I think this really is about... We have conquered your land, your earth, so you have to present us with the land and water, the waterways, especially, you know, Athens is known for its navy, and a lot of these places are coastal or their islands. Um, I think that's really what's going on here, but I wanted to point that out because it's interesting, and if you come across it, I think that's really what it's talking about. I wish it had to do with the four elements, I don't think it does. But anyway, the war drags on, um, and in 480 BCE, Athens itself gets destroyed. The city gets destroyed. Now, they had a little bit of advance notice, and they evacuated almost everybody out, apart from a small contingent of people who held the Acropolis, and they were eventually massacred. Some of the city would have been rebuilt, uh, but a lot of it was sort of just left the way that it was. So when if you're in Athens... Any time after 480, you are going to see the remnants of this battle. And the destruction of Athens happens um, not at the exact same time, but very, very closely in time to the Battle of Salamis, which is Athens's greatest victory against the Persians. Different Greek city-states shown as like the, the heroes of different battles, but Athens really was the hero of Salamis. And that's because Salamis was a naval battle, and Athens was known for its navy. It is both triumphing and, and proving to the other Greek city-states what a powerhouse it actually is, and at the same time, the city of Athens is being destroyed. Or not, again, not simultaneously minute by minute, but in the same time period. And the Battle of Salamis is a major, major setback for the Persians. It's not the definitive end of the war, but it is a major loss for the Persians. And Xerxes, the king at the time, has to kind of, you know, retreat with his tail between his legs, having unnecessarily lost a bunch of men. Eight years later, this defeat of Xerxes is the setting of the play The Persians, which is also by Aeschylus, although this one is definitely by Aeschylus. This would have been his first play, and it was produced in 472 BCE. So again, you're coming to the city to watch this play, you know what happened. Aeschylus himself was a veteran of the Persian Wars. He fought at Salamis, he fought at other battles like Marathon. He lost a brother in the war, uh, so this is close and personal to him, but it's also close and personal to the other Athenians 
who are looking around at their destroyed city. I'm not gonna go through this play because unfortunately it is not a good representation of Persian religion. We get nothing about Zoroastrianism whatsoever. Uh, they're basically practicing a Greek religion in the play, which would not have been accurate, but it would have been a way for the Greek audience to kind of understand what was going on. So you have the Persian queen mother pouring out a libation to Zeus and talking about fate and all sorts of very Greek things. And I'm sure they knew about Greek religion just like the Greeks knew about Persian religion. But anyway, that, that takes place in 472 is when that play is first put on. Very shortly after that in 466, Ionia regains its independence and becomes Greek once again. And then just a few short years later, the war ends with a treaty. So Ionia is kind of this liminal space between Greek and Persian territory. It's Greek, then it's Persian, then it's Greek again. The Ionian philosophers that we talked about last time are prior to the Persian War, so they would have been totally Greek. But then that area... Uh, gets tossed back and forth as something like that is going on. There's a lot of interaction. As soon as Ionia comes under Persian control, you know there were Persians settling there and practicing their religion. So one outcome of the Persian War is a much closer tie between Persian and Greek culture. And another outcome of the Persian Wars is that Athens comes off looking mighty powerful and showing everybody else in the Greek confederations really what they can do and how valuable they are. So Athens comes out as the most powerful Greek city-state at the end of the Persian Wars. But it was not to last because only a few short years later, uh, Sparta, another major powerful city-state in ancient Greece, recognized that Athens was gaining a lot of power, getting a lot of money, and making a lot of decisions for the rest of Greece. And Sparta didn't feel comfortable with Athens being the hegemon of Greek society. So we end up with the Peloponnesian War, uh, which is fought primarily between Athens and its allies and Sparta and its allies. And Athens does not win the Peloponnesian War, so it's not totally destroyed or anything like that, but Sparta becomes much, much more powerful. And this is the world that the most famous Greek philosopher is born into. Plato is born sometime in the 420s BCE, and he lives and works in Athens which is where his philosophical school is founded and remains uh, long after his death. If you've heard of any Greek philosopher, you've definitely heard of Plato. He is so influential that everything that comes before him we call pre-Socratic philosophy, because Plato writes dialogues that mostly feature his teacher Socrates. He founds a philosophical school called the Academy, and even though it's not the only philosophical school, it is the most influential going forward. In Roman times, it actually became part of the regular curriculum for students to memorize and recite passages of Plato as part of their education. And even now, I mean, if you're in Greek 2 or Greek 3, you're probably reading the symposium. Plato's philosophy, especially his stuff about, like, death and the afterlife and the nature of the soul, is hugely influential in the development of Christian doctrine as well, although that is another story for another day. The dialogue that I want to talk about is called the Timaeus, and I can't believe I'm reading the Timaeus again. I just covered this dialogue when I was talking about numerology last year, and here we are again what a wild, wild dialogue this is. If you've ever read it, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't read it, just try and read a little bit of it. It's out there. There's a lot of different stuff that Plato covers in the Timaeus, but essentially it is his cosmic creation story. How did the universe come to be? What are some of the ins and outs of how the universe works, and interestingly for us, uh, what is the role of the four elements in all of this? Now, I had said last time that even though the theory of the four elements had been established by Empedocles and was largely adopted by this point, 
we had not yet had the actual word in Greek for element. And that's because it first comes up in this dialogue. The word that Plato uses is stoicheion, which comes from the verb stoicheo, which means to go in a line, to kind of like arrange. Plato's not inventing this noun from the verb. This was already a word in use. It was primarily used for letters of the alphabet. And really what it signified was some kind of smallest part of something that can't be divided anymore. So if you have a sentence, you can divide that sentence into individual phrases. The phrases can be divided into words, and the words can be divided into letters, but then after that, the letters can't be divided into anything else. And so that's the word that Plato chooses to use to describe these four elements, stoicheion. And he says it's actually hard for us to talk about the four elements and figure out what's going on with the four elements because we're limited by our own sense perception. Now, I should say also that by this time there were theories about atoms and things like that floating around in the universe, things that are so small they're imperceptible to the human eye. So Plato understands that the observable world is different from the actual world, or we're not getting the full picture, and for that reason it's hard to talk about the four elements because we may not actually know what's going on. Nevertheless, he's going to try his best. So he asks questions like, is there such a thing as fire itself? Uh, fire all by itself. Is there a fundamental principle called fire? And he believes that there is. He says, here's a proposition we shall always affirm above all else. The god fashioned these four kinds to be as perfect and excellent as possible when they were not so before. So he believes fully in this concept of four principles that everything else comes from and that behave in ways that he's going to try and figure out. And he calls the four elements bodies, or somata, to kind of suggest that they have a uh, substance or corporality somehow. And Plato takes the position that the four elements are not eternal. And that's because he believes in this kind of cycle where the elements turn into one another. So, for example, we can observe that water, if conditions are right, will evaporate and turn into vapor, which will float upwards into the sky, coalesce in clouds, which then rains back down. And so the elements are not so stable. Uh, it, it's not right to say that fire is fire. It's more like fire is fire right now until it becomes earth or water or air. It's mutable, it's changeable, it's like a state of being as opposed to a constant eternal thing that is always the same. Now the main thing that Plato talks about when it comes to the elements in this dialogue is the connection between the four elements and geometry. Plato is of the opinion that Everything in the universe can be explained through mathematical principles and models. He uses geometry to describe, I mean, everything, his birth of the cosmos and how everything works, including the four elements. Now, what he does with the elements is he maps them onto different shapes that we refer to in the modern day as platonic solids, platonic from Plato, although he says that these are actually from the Pythagoreans. And there are five of them, but there are four elements. And he claims that if you were able to like, see with your own eyes the smallest amount of fire, it would have a certain shape. The smallest amount of water would have a certain shape. It almost, almost like atoms. And so he maps the shapes onto the elements based on characteristics. So here are the four elements and their shapes. Fire is a tetrahedron, air is an octahedron, water is an icosahedron, and earth is a cube. Now, the fifth platonic solid is a dodecahedron, which just makes me think of the phantom toll booth, but he doesn't map that onto an element. He says basically that the god, whatever god that is, 
uh, some kind of like primordial creator deity. Again, he influenced Christianity very heavily. This god used the dodecahedron to create the universe and everything in it, although he doesn't say how or how he knows that. But anyway, the, the way that the shapes map onto the elements, like I said, is from their characteristics. So Earth is a cube, uh, because Earth is really solid and sturdy, and a cube is solid and sturdy. And fire is a tetrahedron, because a triangle or a pyramid has really sharp points, and fire is kind of pointy, it feels pointy, right? And then because he has now these four shapes mapped onto the four elements, he says we can figure out which of the elements was generated first. So fire was generated first, he says, because it has the smallest number of sides, then air, water, and then earth. This geometrical model leads Plato to conclude that, in fact, it's not the case that all four elements can easily change into one another, but the three hedrons, that is fire, air, and water, are all composed of triangles with uneven sides, so they can change back and forth, but it's more complicated for Earth because Earth is made up of an isosceles triangle. So even when something happens to capital E Earth, i.e. it gets broken up by fire's sharpness, because fire is sharp and it can cut things, regardless of what happens, Earth is not going to, say, turn into fire uh, because it is stable as it is. It's solid. It's, it's a cube. It's not going anywhere. It's not doing anything. But the other three can change. Um, if they are broken up, they can be reformed into the other elements because it's just a different combination of the same kind of triangles. So when the elements get reformed into some quantity of the other elements, um, if an element changes into fire, it will stop getting cut up because fire can't cut itself. And in general, elements can't change themselves. They can only influence and change the other elements. But say if fire is acting on water, that doesn't mean that water is going to be reformed into fire. It could just so easily be reformed into air. Essentially, this is like a rock beats scissor kind of situation where fire can like overpower these other elements and cut them and change them. And then the last thing he says about the elements, or at least the last thing we're going to talk about, is that each element has different kinds of the element within it. So for example, fire has flame, it has embers, uh, it has like a spark, uh, and this is due, you guessed it, to variety and like uh, discrepancy in the shapes and quantities of the triangles. And importantly, he says that ether is a form or a kind of air in the way that flame is a kind of fire. We'll come back to ether later, that's going to be really important. To summarize Plato's view on the elements, it's all about the triangles, it's all about the shapes. We can't see anything, but he's confident that this is how it works. Fire can cut things and elements can transform into others if they have like-minded triangles. Like I said, Plato is hugely influential in his lifetime and also after his lifetime. There are several ancient reports, including like Seneca, um, who says that there were Persian Magoi who actually came to Athens and studied at Plato's academy. There's also modern scholarship uh, that finds some references to Zoroastrianism in Plato's work, not specifically the Timaeus, but like other work of his. I didn't find enough to confidently say that Plato was significantly influenced by Zoroastrianism, but he definitely knew about it. I think it's almost certain that he would have met Magoi, and he definitely would have understood the basic tenets of Zoroastrian religion. But Plato knew a little bit about everything. I actually recently heard this fabulous talk um, at the SCS this year about how Plato may have known how cursed tablets were made and the kind of language that were used on cursed tablets because for some reason it's showing up in his work. Uh, that was an awesome talk. I've heard other 
uh, arguments made that Plato knew about this religion and that philosophy. Uh, so he really kind of learned everything. Um, so it's not like he was a card-carrying Zoroastrian, but he definitely would have known about it. And it may be the case that he actually influenced some Zoroastrians who made the trip all the way out to Athens. And likewise, Plato's successor, Aristotle, uh, would have known about Zoroastrianism, may have been influenced by it in some way or another, uh, but certainly was influenced by Plato himself. He was a student of Plato, and he was Plato's successor when Plato died and the academy went to uh, a new principal or a new head of school. When Plato died, uh, there are some like later sources that connect Plato's death to the 6,000-year cycle. The Zoroastrian calendar has like 6,000-year cycles, and people linked Plato's death to be about 6,000 years after Zoroaster himself lived. Last time I said that there was debate about when Zoroaster actually lived, but the traditional dating is that he lived 6,000 years prior to Plato which would make Plato kind of like the, the second coming of Zoroaster. And it's true, I mean, after Plato's death, uh, especially in like the later periods, like the Roman period, you get things like Neoplatonic philosophy, which in a sense is kind of like a Plato religion. He becomes this quasi-religious figure, and like Empedocles, when he says something, it just kind of sticks. So Aristotle follows in Plato's footsteps and he takes a lot of things that Plato says for granted. Although I should say that in some of the treatises we're going to cover today, he actually directly refutes some of what Plato says, although he doesn't call him out by name. He calls everybody else out by name. Poor Anaxagoras. <laughs> Now, if you thought that Plato and his triangles were confusing, get ready, because Aristotle's philosophy is dense, it's complicated. Uh, part of the reason for that is because most of what we have of his is preserved in the form of notes, whether it's like his own lecture notes or notes from his students. It's not a fully polished treatise, necessarily. We have a ton of Aristotle's writings, it's just a little garbled and a little confusing to follow. So I'm going to do the best I can to present some of Aristotle's ideas on the elements, but if you are confused about stuff, let me know in the comments and I can try and sort it out a little bit if I'm not explaining it exactly correctly. Or if you have encountered this material before and I'm messing something up, please let me know because I would not be surprised. The primary work of Aristotle's that I'm going to be covering is On the Heavens, uh, peri uranu in Greek, and a lot of the times in scholarship it's referred to as de kylo, which is the Latin name for it. And as you can imagine, this is a cosmological treatise, a little bit of astronomy, uh, lots of math, lots of like lines and physics, and all sorts of interesting stuff. Now, Aristotle takes for granted that there are four elements. First of all, Plato said so. Um, but also Plato took that for granted because Empedocles said so. But this is not the only theory of the elements, and Aristotle spends a lot of time complaining about alternate theories rather than fire, earth, water, and air. Somebody like Anaxagoras says that the elements are what he calls homeomerous things, that is, uh, like, things that are made up of similar parts, and Aristotle gives examples like flesh and bone. So for Anaxagoras, bone is a fundamental universal element. And Aristotle says that's crap. And he uses Empedocles as like the poster child for the four elements theory. So he sets up this kind of comparison between people who follow Anaxagoras and people who follow Empedocles. Empedocles is clearly correct. Maybe most excitingly for us, Aristotle gives us a definition for the elements. So we know that there are four elements, we know that they are fire, earth, water, and air, but he gives a definition for the elements, uh, and I'll read that to you now. He says, an element, we take it, is a body into which other bodies may be analyzed, 
present in them potentially or in actuality, which of these is still disputable, and not itself divisible into bodies different in form. That, or something like it, is what all men in every case mean by element. So an element is the smallest part of something, really. And he spends a lot of time trying to show that there are four elements. Uh, because it's not... Like, he takes it for granted, and Plato takes it for granted, but not everybody does. So, again, poor Anaxagoras, he just complains that Anaxagoras says that there's, like, an infinite number of elements. So he proves systematically that there are four. First, he says, well, are there an infinite number or are there a finite number of elements? In the observable world, there are a finite number of differences between things. And if there's a finite number of differences, there must be a finite number of things that can be different from one another. So naturally, there are a finite number of elements. And if you don't believe the argument about differences, he makes a similar argument about movement. So there's a finite number of simple movements, and therefore there should be a finite number of simple bodies. Simple bodies, uh, again, somata, bodies, this is the same word that Plato used to describe the elements, and Aristotle is arguing that simple bodies, as opposed to, like, complex bodies, you know, can't be broken down into anything else. In other words, elements. So once he proves, or thinks he has proven, that there's a finite number of elements, he says, okay, well, how many are there? Are there one or more than one? And then he directly responds to what we talked about last time, this quest for the RK. He says it's not really possible that there's going to be, like, one thing that is the only thing. If there's one thing that everything is measured against, every measurement will be a relative measurement, because you're measuring it against this one thing. So, for example, if water and air are measured against each other, like, naturally, instinctively, we would say that water is denser than air, but if there's more air in your sample and less water in your sample, then you're going to come out with a skewed measurement. So for that reason, there must be more than one thing. Uh, because if you're measuring something against this one thing and your measurement is relative, you might mistakenly label something water that is actually fire or air. Uh, so this is no good. And aside from that, people who claim that there is a single arche assign to the arche a single movement. And if that is the thing that makes up the entire universe, there would only be one movement. But we know there's lots of different kind of movements. You can zigzag, you can move in a circle. Uh, so he says that's no good, there's no arche. Clearly, there's more than one element. The next question he tries to answer is one that Plato tackled also. Are elements eternal, or are they generated and destroyed? And this one is a lot easier to wrap at least my head around, uh, because he says we know that elements can't be eternal because, for example, we can see with our own eyes that fire gets quenched when you put water on it. Or fire will, like, burn itself out. Now, he doesn't know that, like, in both cases it's just being deprived of oxygen, so when a fire goes out, seemingly of its own accord, it's because it's run out of fuel or something, he's thinking that it can just sort of, like, spontaneously destroy itself. I'm sure if he knew that fire feeds on oxygen, he would find a way to, like, make a relationship between fire and air. And he says, okay, so we know that elements can be destroyed. I just gave you an example with the fire being quenched by water. And if they can be destroyed, then surely they must be able to be generated. And if they're generated, how are they generated? What are they generated from? It can't be something incorporeal, so it must be something corporeal, because no matter can't turn into matter. Aristotle also does not believe in the concept of a void, so he doesn't believe that there can be space where there is no matter. Because there's no such thing as matterless space, there's no way that the elements could be generated from something in that matterless space because it doesn't exist. But the elements can't be generated from something outside of the elements because the elements are like the fundamental basic principles. 
so they can't be generated from some other kind of body, so therefore they must be generated from each other. And the question of how elements are generated from each other, he spends pretty much the rest of the work trying to figure out. He makes a lot of arguments from, like, how different things move. He talks about lines and shapes and, and matter and movement and all sorts of stuff. But he also gives us kind of like what everybody else says on this subject. So, for example, he says that the Empedocleans say that an element is generated from a body that had the element within it the whole time. But Aristotle rejects this because it doesn't constitute a change or a generation, it's really just an emerging of the fire from where it was contained. And he says, if air turns into water, it becomes heavier. And how could it be heavier if it had the water contained in it the whole time? Because it would have contained all of the weight that the water had to begin with. So he says, that's no good, this is not how uh, it works. And the alternative theory is that the elements change into one another by somehow like changing their shape or operating on a plane. So we're back to triangles here. Uh, but he says that's not possible because, as Plato told us, and we all know Plato's right, that Earth can't participate in that because its triangles are not the right kind of triangles. So how would that work? And essentially, he says that we shouldn't think of each of the elements as having a distinctive shape. Now, this, to me at least, is going against what Plato says. So he says that this wouldn't be a good way to explain how the elements change into one another. Although he also says that elements shouldn't, like, we shouldn't think of them as having their own distinct shape. Because they have to be like, transferable between one another. So that is the most kind of, like, nebulous topic that Aristotle tackles when it comes to the elements. What are they, how many are there, and how do they move from one to another? I'm gonna move on now to other stuff that Aristotle says that does make a little bit more sense. Or at least is easier to understand, I think. There's this awesome part in book two where he tackles this question that apparently is a hot topic among Greek philosophers, and that is, what is the core of the universe actually made out of? And he essentially just lists people who he thinks are wrong. So he starts with our friend Xenophanes. Remember, Xenophanes was the guy that thought that the Arche was Earth. Aristotle says, well, Xenophanes says that the the core is Earth, that Earth goes down to infinity if you, like, you know, if you were able to dig down into the Earth in any sort of meaningful way, it would just go on for infinity. And Aristotle says, Xenophanes only says that because he can't think of anything better to say. He says that the Pythagoreans think that the center of the universe is fire, and that Earth somehow is a satellite of it, and it moves around. And then there's also other satellites of this fiery center, and there's also something called like a counter-Earth. So the Earth and the counter-Earth kind of like mirror each other, and then there's also other things. And the Pythagoreans say that this is why you get things like eclipses. And Aristotle thinks that's stupid. How could, how could the Earth revolve around a fiery body? That's dumb. And then lastly, our old friend Thales thinks that the core of the universe is water because the Earth sits on top of water. And he also talks about flat earthers and stuff like that. It's a pretty cool passage um, if you want to check it out. I think if you're only going to read one thing from this treatise, that's probably the most fun. So other things that Aristotle gives us, there's a treatise called On Generation and Corruption, roughly the same time period. This is a long treatise, there's a lot going on in it, but the most exciting thing that I found in On Generation and Corruption is that Aristotle gives the four elements their qualities. So fire is hot and dry, air is hot and wet, water is cold and wet, and earth is cold and dry. You might remember these qualities from Hippocrates we talked about last time, Hippocrates' theory of the four humors and their qualities. 
And I mentioned that even though Hippocrates doesn't map his four humors onto the four elements, later students do. And I think that has to do with this kind of assigning these qualities to the elements, the same way they're assigned to the four humors. They just map so neatly onto one another. Now, I told you that Aristotle takes for granted that there are four elements, and that is true. He does believe that fire, earth, water, and air are the fundamental earthly elements from which all observable matter are created. But because Aristotle is so interested in how the four elements move and how they change from one to another, he actually can't accept any of the theories, like, for example, Empedocles says that the sun and the stars are made up of fire. He says that the four elements are earthly and changeable, and you can observe them changing from one to another, and you can see them moving around. But you can't observe the same kind of change in the heavens. So the idea that the heavens would be composed of one of these elements is impossible. So he theorizes that the heavens are made up of something different, something outside the four elements. So the four elements make up everything that we see on Earth, and then everything in the heavens is made up of something else. Now, he doesn't use the word ether to describe this fifth element, although um, later scholars of his work did use that term. Cicero is an example. The term ether is kind of an interesting one to use, though, because it has, up until this point, been like a kind of air. Uh, the ether in mythology is the upper air. Prometheus, like I said earlier, calls upon the ether, but he's not calling upon this fifth element. He's just using it as a term for, like, the kind of air that he's describing. And Aristotle says that Anaxagoras actually equates fire and ether. And so there are theories that the heavens are made up of this fiery ether. And Aristotle says, no, this is something different. This fifth element that exists only in the heavens and not on earth is a separate thing and it behaves differently and it moves differently and it doesn't change into other things the way that the elements do. This fifth element theory is not tremendously popular in antiquity, uh, but it does become very important, say, for medieval alchemy. Okay, I've had enough. Have y'all had enough triangles for the day? At this point, what we can say is that the four elements, fire, earth, water, and air, are taken for granted among the most influential philosophical schools, and as a result, they become kind of the predominant theory, um, henceforth. So the task of philosophers now is not really so much to prove that there are four elements, but what they are, how they behave. There's so much more to say about this time period, but we would be here literally for days. So next time we're going to jump ahead uh, and we're going to look at the Hellenistic period, some Roman stuff, and we're really going to start to focus on the esoteric. But one question about classical Athens remains, and that is... What's going on with magic? I think I said last time that magic itself was not established as a separate discipline necessarily. There was so much overlap between what we would call magic, things like spells, incantations, potions and stuff, and religion, which in itself was still being developed. But now in the classical period, you have two distinctive ideas popular state-sponsored religious movements, and that includes things like mystery religions, although there's always a, you know, a gray area there. And on the other hand, you have magic, which we start to see a separate terminology for that stuff. Interestingly, uh, the term magic comes from the Persian magoi, uh, it's generally a pejorative term, and it means, like, sorcerer, but, like, charlatan sorcerer, a uh, magician, pulling a fast one on somebody somehow. And there's especially tension between magic and philosophy, because philosophers consider themselves 
rational thinkers and they think that magoi or there's another set of terms like goetes that those guys are doing something that doesn't work is not based in science or fact or anything and is just for silly people who probably learned it from foreigners so we'll talk more about magic next time and in particular we're going to meet an old friend of ours who practices herbal magic the way that Medea is written in the 5th century, uh, primarily in Euripides' play called Medea, there's not an emphasis at all on her craft. We don't see her do any magic, but that changes in the Hellenistic period. So we'll pick up in the Hellenistic period next time. That's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, you can let me know by leaving a thumbs up or writing in the comments. And if you want to see part three of this series, feel free to subscribe to the channel. So thanks again for watching. I really appreciate you and I will see you in part three.